Our next speaker is Dr. Ali Sarosh. Dr. Ali Sarosh is Associate Professor, Air University, Islamabad. He holds a PhD in Space Vehicle Design and a Master's degree in pr Space Propulsion Technologies. Dr. Sarosh has been a principal investigator of more than 15 high-end in high industrial research works funded by NASCOM, SPACO and PAF. He is the inventor of two design patents in hypersonic launch systems and rocket-based combined cycle engines. Dr. Sarosh has been appointed as member of Technical Advisory Committee on Global Hypersonic Space Technologies by the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Dr. Sarosh has been the founding director of the Space Education and Research Program, jointly funded by the Pakistan Air Force and National University of Science and Technology. He is a tech entrepreneur and founding CEO of Shocks and Stars Private Limited. He is recipient of Imtiazi Sanat by the government of Pakistan. He will express his views on evolution of space power in South Asia, civil and military applications. Uh, so before I commence, uh, we have included some of our actual works that's been going on at our facilities. Uh, we have two or three research labs. And uh, that includes, uh, we actually call ourselves technology strategists because we build technologies based on strategy. And this is something which is very cutting edge these days around the world. And we're trying to follow the socks and stars actually is uh, all about doing this stuff. And uh, the IAA at Air University has been very supportive of us in uh, uh, building. So we are, uh, all the works have been uh, performed by, by this group and supported by the Air University there. Thank you, Vidyata Scott. <coughs> I'm Dr. Sarosh, and I'll be talking about uh, space power evolution in South Asia, specifically South Asia, with civil and military applications. The last 20 years or so have witnessed a major shift in global space power, and we add to this the fact that a lot of new commercial actors have entered into the market, and they are involved in getting commercialization, innovation, and uh, but this also brings about a lot of congestion in space, and a lot of competition is going to uh, is actually blooming. Now, South Asian countries, they are neither benign nor hermetic to the global change. They have been making considerable progress in the development and utilization of space power. Sometimes this is driven by a need for change, but often this has been out of rivalry and status. Nevertheless, the civil application of space technologies have already penetrated into nearly almost every household in South Asia. The military aspect of space technology has been equally significant, but specific more to the case of India and Pakistan. Space-based systems are becoming increasingly significant both for weapons and vessels. It will just be a matter of time before the spin-off effects, the technology competition, and the perpetual regional rivalry will draw in new competitors in this race too. But as the space assets of the countries around the world and in South Asia continue to grow, so does the need to protect these safe, uh, safe uh, space assets too. And that brings us to the point of space power with the space warfare. The, space, uh, the term space power is broad, it's uh, wholesome, and it encompasses an entity's ability to project itself in both civilian and military domains uh, through the space medium. In essence, space power, be it in the military form or in the commercial form, is actually a manifestation of the phenomena called space dominance, and that's the game changer of the 21st century. We have to dominate space, as uh, the keynote speaker just mentioned. The ability to provide commercial space services uh, to subscribers at micro market rates and hence become an active member of the global uh, uh, space economy, such as SpaceX and uh, Altium Technologies, is sometimes actually a bigger part of the overall space power than actually the space warfare. The space warfare, of course, is a military operation, an act of launching attack from Earth to space, from space to space, and from uh, space back to Earth on the adversary while, of course, operating beyond the Kalman line. The pinnacle of military space technology power is actually counter space technology, something that we, our research groups have been working on for a couple of years now. The ability to deceive, disrupt, deny, degrade, or destroy an adversary's system so as to gain obvious military advantages. Yet, as we always say, this is just one part of the overall space power. It is also the collective wisdom of the past decades that countries that have invested first in building their civilian space programs using legacy systems, then gone on to develop their own indigenous technologies 
uh, with the space uh, qualified parts and have they have all successfully accelerated their military space program. It has never been vice versa. It's always been from civilian to space, uh, military. Now with global tra space powers treading very fast on the path of uh, creating and expanding their space force structures, the existing treaties are falling behind. They're actually becoming feeble and unwholesome. For now, the only mechanism which is keeping the world from descending into a total space weapons chaos is no treaty. It's actually a very delicate equilibrium that exists between the relative abilities of the global space powers. No treaties are holding us back at this moment. This is the global backdrop under which the entire uh, development of space power is evolving in South Asia. The evolution of space power in South Asia is actually uh, su subject to whatever is happening in the world. The evolution in South Asia has been an asymmetrical process. Its history has had varying overtones. Whilst India's space program from its inception has been predominantly civilian with recent military spin-offs, that of Pakistan has had very profound military overtones. Today, while Pakistan is toiling hard to become a regional space player, India has unfortunately cut into the global league. With 75 orbital spacecraft, they have an LEO to GEO and GTO launch capacity. They have interplanetary exploratory spacecraft. They have uh, uh, 13 uh, military spacecraft. They have the rest are all commercial spacecraft. And they have a evolving counter space technologies program, which we do not have at this moment. India's strategy has been very simple. We've gone through the strategy a lot for over a couple of years. They've just followed the best practices in town of the space industry, and that is to build a commercially viable space program, sustainable space program, and then venture into space warfare. And this is the scheme that almost every successful space power in the world has done. India has done no magic, but somehow has you know, as Bilal mentioned, we have missed out on this bad wagon very early in the journey. The evolution of space power on Pakistan's side has, however, been less organic. An inevitable need for reactionary spontaneity to adversary stimuli. A reduced degree of acceptance of technology failures during the evolutionary processes and a retrograded priority for commercialization. All of these have unfortunately turned out to be less beneficial than expected both from the standpoint of space, uh, space technology and from space economy perspective. Thus for Pakistan to come out of this economic, security, conundrum-like situation, it's never too late to make some very fundamental corrections as our honorable keynote member, uh, the speaker also mentioned. We need to take, uh, what I suggest, a uh, fundamental correction would be to take one step back, make some corrections and start going on the right, start going on the wrong, right track now. This approach is needed now more than ever before. But before I dwell into the how we do that, uh, we need to first look at, because we're focusing on South Asia, we need to look at how India's been doing with their space ambitions. Although India has acquired over the past five uh, decades of experience in commercial space applications and technologies, their military space tech is only about two decades old. Even today, India's bedrock of space technology is not their military space power, it's actually their commercial space power problem. Just in the last 10 years, they have launched over 353 international satellites, earned over, uh, I, I, the figure is about 30 million US dollars from the North Americas. They have earned over 180 million euros from the European customers. And uh, just yesterday, they have signed contract with Singapore to send their next nine, 10 satellites aboard their PSLV, which is their workhorse. The availability of this commercial space revenue, their homegrown legacy technologies, and a burgeoning economy that they have right now, offers a perfect recipe for them to now start their space warfare. And that's why they started just about two decades back. Since 2009, India has used China's ASAT tests of 2007 as a pretext for building the counter space program. And it was in 2010 when their Air Chief Marshal PV-9 openly stated, our satellites are vulnerable to ASAT weapon systems because our neighborhood possesses one. And that has given them, that this has given them the license or the legitimate reason to build up their technology program. Now, I'm, what I'm gonna do is, because this is a technology talk, so I'm gonna cover some of the technologies, the offensive counter space technologies that India is working upon and where they will stand at this moment. This is a list of those technologies. 
the first set is co-orbital A set. This is one of the most complicated maneuver that requires rendezvous proximity operations in the clandestine mode. India does not have this capability at this moment. But they are about five years from doing their first RPO in orbit. And when they do their RPO in orbit, it will take them another five more years to do their first co-orbital A set. Now looking at the significance of this uh, thing, my uh, astrodynamics research team has built a very important mission which was conducted by WU-14. Uh, also, this was conducted by SJ-21, which was China's ASAT. As you can see, <coughs> China used this pretext of doing a space debris remediation in a dual-use mode. So we have the, this is the Beidou Beacon satellite, and this was SJ-21. This is in the sparkling orbit. And as you can see, this is an actual mission we have designed it all over and accelerated about 1,000 times. And this is how it grabbed it, took it out of its orbit, took it to a transfer orbit, demonstrated the ability, then brought it back to its own orbital orbit, then it left it in its orbit, and the SJ-21 went back. This was the first and the most perfect demonstration of how a dual-use space technology could have been used for space debris remediation and taking out somebody's satellite, grabbing away somebody's satellite. This, uh, so, uh, so we built this up for uh, this session. The second set of technologies that India, which is actually called as uh, the cult of all the uh, space warfare, is ASAT. And to, there are three levels of ASAT. The one below 500, the one above 500, and the one which goes into MEO and GEO. The one below 500 is the easier part, where 300 kilometers, as most of the people have done, 37 tests off of America, 80% down here. 33, uh, 33 of America, 37 of you, Russia, 90% uh, done below this thing. Why China's ASAT was different is because it was done at 850 kilometers. Now, it is India's enduring desire that they want to cut into the league of 800 kilometers. There's a lot of problem here when you cut into that league. It's because, it, first of all, they will have to change their launcher from Prithvi's, it will have to change to the ICBM Agni 5, which is a big deal. But an even bigger deal is actually this thing here, space situational awareness. India currently runs the NETRA program. The NETRA program is their sensory network connected to the space situation awareness. Its accuracy was good when it was about collaborative spacecraft. But when it is about non-collaborative spacecraft, I mean uh, enemy spacecraft or space debris, they could not track it. So they were, went through the Comcasa agreement of 2018. Nothing really worked out. But then uh, Modi's government went for the big agreement, which is basic exchange of uh, uh, classified information agreement. And this BICA 2020 has given them the legitimate edge. Now the space, the, sen the sensory network of the US Space Force Command is providing them the most high fidelity data. This is going to be integrated to their NETRA work. And so they will be, after about eight months, India will be in a position to pick up the best possible ASAT combination wherever they want to do. And then if they uh, uh, integrate this Agni 5 launcher, they are in a very good position to actually carry out a high altitude ASAT. Of course, they will have to live with the, uh, the debris problem. Unfortunately, why India is so pushed about this ASAT is because one, it holds the cult status and uh, it gives India the technological progress of being a military power. It also is a very important thing. In 1968, when the nuclear non-proliferation treaty was being signed, India missed that opportunity of being a, uh, becoming a member of that committee because they had delayed the nuclear test in 1974. Now, there is no treaty at this point for ASATs. And if any future space travel treaty comes in, and India is already an ASAT operator, so they, that treaty cannot be signed in without India being on board. So that's a big status for them. On the EW side, they are looking for what is called counter communication system, which is total jamming, L band, C band, K band, KU band, KA band and if possible X-band. They are also looking for a full spectrum GNSS jamming. And they are about three years from achieving this thing. The directed energy weapons, something which India is uh, very hard pushed on doing it, but they are actually delayed by about three to four years at this moment. It's because uh, they are unable to cool their lasers to an infinite time, and they do not have what is called a neutral particle beaming, which can overcome the magnetic field of the Earth. So their they, the lasers are not very well directed. So they, are, they have serious, serious issues with this delay here. So on the other hand, what they're trying to do is, they're going to accelerate their BrahMos program. At the bottom is the fraction orbit bombardment system, which was mentioned in the opening. And this is, uh, my mission team has reconstructed this mission. This is a false mission performed by WU-14 of China. 
what Fox does is, is goes, it goes out like a launch vehicle. So it's all nothing but a launch vehicle going out in the orbit. And it just goes around like an or in a, in a circular orbit around the Earth. And after covering a fraction of the orbit, it starts to behave like a ballistic missile. It opens up and what it reveals is not actually a payload, but actually a, uh, a weapon, which is usually a boost light weapon. So we constructed this entire WU-14 mission and I've accelerated it, of course, about a thousand times uh, for the for the paucity of time. So this is just like a launch with a WU-14 pitching out and then entering the orbit, the first stage runs out just like a launch vehicle. If it was a ICBM, it would start turning under the gravity assist and it would start to come down. But it is now proceeding into the circular orbit around the Earth. And uh, of course the third stage burn will stay with the orbit. And at this point the uh, fairings will open up. And when the fairings they open up, this is the fairing door, it reveals a weapon inside. This weapon, instead of traveling the entire orbit, which is this entire orbit, covers only a fraction from here and then turns downward. It fires the engines, it can come down as an accelerated V weapon at, at Mach 28, or it can come down at a slower speed, and we are working on a boost, boost light system as well for this particular thing. So this entire mission is, was done by W14 over a period of 214 days. So we just uh, cut out the rest of the time and did the first part and joined it for the last part. So this is the entire, the, for India, the BrahMos 2 is their lifeline here. So what we are looking forward is, this this thing what the WU-14 has done is actually it has uh, speeded up the world's hypersonic weapons, space hypersonic weapons. So these are the fleeted weapons at this moment, WU-14 we've already seen here, and we have only Russia and China running this race at this moment. And we have more weapons now coming in from uh, USA, we have five from USA, we have two more coming in from China, and India is going to attach the BrahMos 2 together with an advanced technology demonstrator vehicle. This, instead of being a vehicle, is going to be a boost light vehicle. It's going to glide through and then that light will go to, uh, to the target, and it's going to hit the target. So they have a big way to go, but they are, on, uh, they are actually getting a lot of support on ATDV from their Russian counterparts. So, but why is India doing this? They, I mean, in South Asia, they don't have any match at this moment. So the question is, if they do it, then there must be some threat matrix to it. So I'm going to build the threat matrix for them. India's threat matrix is very unique. This table actually represents India's threat matrix versus China's counter space operations. The dark brown actually indicates the severity. The light brown indicates the low degree of severity of the threat. As we can see, this is the entire full array of space assets that India has. Along the left are these full array of counter space technologies that China offers. There is hardly a technology we see here to which there is not a direct and imminent threat from China. So India's issues are genuine. Now when we compare this uh, threat matrix with Pakistan's threat matrix, there is hardly an asset we have in orbit except for the TTNC station, the communication satellite, some navigation services and the Earth orbit satellite that already uh, uh, some of our mentioned. And the Indian OCSO is also not as developed, it's developing. So Pakistan's threat matrix is very different from what the threat matrix is that of India. So there are a couple of conclusions we have made here. The first thing is the, the ever increasing array of Indian assets in orbit and on the ground implies that India finds itself under a far greater pressure to develop an offensive and defensive counter space program to counter Beijing at this moment. The overall level of perceived threat to India's space assets is actually far greater than that posed to Pakistan. Pakistan has fewer assets and India's counter space program is still evolving. There is rarely an Indian space asset that does not have a direct and imminent threat from China's counter space capability, which is now near full spectrum CSO capable of matching the US. And for Pakistan what it means is that any, any a minimal amount of change that India does in its capacity that is going, any augmentation in Indian offensive program will have, a, will pose a disproportionate threat to Pakistan. So we have, uh, with every step, we will be left behind another decade. So it's a lot of problem for us as India starts to build up its own CSO program. So, based on this background, what should be, in our opinion, be of options for Pakistan in terms of space power for neutralizing and building its own capacity? Nation powers such as Pakistan, cannot afford unlimited uh, assets for space and for militarization, of course. 
Therefore, in my opinion, there are three things that you got to do. First, sustainability, evolvability, and survivability. So we got to do three things. In sustainability, the first and foremost well, is to build up a space program that generates adequate revenues for itself. Get rid of the government funding, dependence on the government. And for that, that to happen, commercialization of space resources is an inevitable option for Pakistan. The space program should be supported by an active research. We should be building, uh, for starting from the legacy system, we should be evolving our own generation of contemporary, just like the parties is already proving that ability for us. We should have our own space qualified parts and then the second phase should be a segment by segment growth. We should have commercialization of every segment, the space segment, the ground segment, and the launch segment. Everything should get to that process. The third part actually is the survivability where the military comes in. This is where we have to build our own defensive counter space capability first. And when we are very good at doing it, then we move on to the offensive counter space capability. So my uh, process that I propose here, my two cents, is spread over about two decades, sir, with your permission, of course. Over this period, what we see is we need to first create, one step back, we need to create a technology strategy think tank. We do not have a single technology strategy think tank at this moment in Pakistan. Whereas India created it about uh, 1978 and then made it into the IDC in 2010. We don't have it at this moment. We need, and this should consist of strategists, it should consist of technology developers, it should consist of military planners, it should consist of prospective financiers for our programs, and the government agencies, all put together under one roof. And they should be the managers of the National Space Program. And one good option would be the, uh, in, the Integrated National Space Center, which is probably coming out somewhere around Chakri area, where we can put these teams together. The second thing would be, the space power must not be thought as military, it should be thought of as a one trillion dollar economy of which Pakistan does not have any share at this moment. We must work on building a tangible commercial space pro program that should lead to high-end technology military spin-offs. And to do that, we will have to collaborate with the private sector, we will have to incubate private sector companies together with Sparco. And then we must endeavor to create a public-private ownership enterprise culture and uh, to do that, we will, uh, of course, we will, we will have to remove all bureaucratic hurdles that exist at the moment I was talking to uh, Chairman Sparko uh, sometimes back. And, uh, for, and if you do that, one of the best options we can do is, uh, we've did the maths for this, my astrodynamics team has done the math, and we have an excellent southern port, and we can use from Hingol till about uh, the, the, the Ormara region, there is a region where we can optimize a 25 degree inclination to 90 degree, so we can have a single space port which can provide retrograde to posigrade launches in the commercial domain. And we should be cashing on this, because every other country, America has to find posigrade they have to go on the eastern coast, retrograde they have to go on to the western coast, China, posigrade on the east coast, retrograde on the Gobi Desert. We are very lucky. We can do two launches from one place, and I'm sure Swarpo must have been working on that portion. This is an excellent opportunity for us. <coughs> the third thing should be, we should be in the military domain, we should start from high fidelity SSA solution. And we are very happy to apprise uh, 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 that it was in 2018 that we built the first uh, S-trap, which was an SSA solution, and this was provided to the ops command from the Air Force and uh, they, they have, they're still using a version of this uh, for them. It has to be integrated with the sensory network and it has to be integrated with Cosmos, it has to be integrated with ISON and both are going to integrate with us and that will make it many folds superior to what India has naturalized at, the, at this moment in time. Then we have to develop and implement a defensive CSO and we, right now we have uh, BMDs, the endo-atmospheric. We will have to go exo-atmospheric. And it, it will have to be at apogee interception. Once we learn how to do apogee interception, only then we will be in a position to fire an offensive CSO. Otherwise, it will be a futile effort. We will not be capacity to handle that technology. And to do the offensive CSO, the best option is use our current intermediate and medium range systems and over a period of 10 years, we need to we can convert them into offensive CSO kinetic weapons. And we can do that. There's not a problem if we just go consistently in this sequence. And the last thing should be we have to invest in dual-use space technologies 
in which they are going to integrate commercialization and space warfare in one package. And the best example of this is space robotics. And in space robotics, we can have uh, uh, on-orbit servicing, uh, we can have debris remediation, and we can do counter space operations by the same satellite. Similarly, hypersonic technologies, for which we have patents also, we can do low-cost space operations, and we can also do FOBs by using the same system. And uh, one of the things that we are working, our teams are working upon, for which we have the patent, this is our patent, uh, our system which was uh, RBCC design, and uh, we, we are very thankful to Nescom that sponsored our entire work, and to uh, portion in Sparko, and uh, the, so we, we built this, this engine can be integrated to a weapon, it can be integrated to a low-cost space transportation system. This is our space robotic system. Sir, this is your PNSS bus. We are very thankful to uh, the beginning that was provided to us. So we converted this bus into a space robot. And uh, this can actually uh, grab satellites, it can grab debris. And uh, we are building missions for this at this moment. And now we have moved from a 50 kg system to over 100 uh, or 900 kg uh, 50 minute view satellite. Because uh, we've seen this system can be demonstrated. We integrated LiDAR and we've integrated space robotics in one package, just for uh, the uh, CSO operations. <clears throat> My final words on this is, in Pakistan, what Pakistan's need is a sustainable, rapidly evolving space program, and a very living space policy. It should be living to the times. That should will convert Pakistan into a credible space power. One that is capable of supporting its own commercial and military needs and those of this region as well. Pakistan must aim for a sustainable space economy and that space economy should be based on orbital systems, it should be based on light lift capability and it should be based on commercial space port operations and from that the spin off will be a military space track that we want. I rest my case sir with the last word from Victor Frankl. And this is the mathematical formula for doing this is stimulus, this is the response, and this is the thinking time in between. If we start, if you want to build something really big, we will have to give ourselves a very winning time here. And only then we can make ourselves work. Thank you, sir.